Well, good evening. I'll good evening. try to uh, speak up so that they're going to record this. I'm uh, technologically um, challenging. I tend to break every camera that exists, so I won't touch it, but don't expect to see it on YouTube. <laughs> it probably won't work out. So tonight, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, gratitude and where it fits in to a whole bunch of things. Um, I'm a psychotherapist. I've been a therapist for about 45 years. Um, so I kind of get a, a feel for things as I've gone along. <clears throat> and um, what I really have done is my early background was in philosophy. And I sort of saw psychotherapy as being philosophy applied in day-to-day -day life. So one of the things that I'm going to talk to you about is values in part of this. And perspectives, and you know, we'll, we'll just play with it. And if you have questions as we go, you don't have to hold them to the end. You know, just kind of like, just get my attention and we'll process stuff. Because that works much better for me. I like to just kind of flow with things. So is that okay? Yeah, sure. sure. Okay. okay. Good. Well, they, yeah. What's the difference between a psychotherapist, a psychologist, and a psychiatrist? There's got to be a difference because you said you're a psychotherapist. Right. Well, a well, let's just start with the easy one. A psychiatrist is a medical doctor um, who goes through medical school and then does residencies in psychiatry. And primarily in this day and age, unfortunately, just prescribes medication. Uh, it's kind of, if you see a psychiatrist, you might see him for 10 minutes or her, whichever, uh, for five or 10 minutes while they simply write out a script and say, there you go. A psychologist is someone who has a PhD in psychology, one of the clinical fields, and uh, they are also licensed to practice. A psychotherapist is different than a social worker. I mean, social workers can also do psychotherapy. They have uh, certain trainings as well. Um, but my background was originally in um, Gestalt psychotherapy. I did a two-year program in that. My own personal work was mostly in Jungian analysis, and for a while I was the president of the uh, Connecticut Association of Jungian Psychology, which doesn't exist anymore, but you know, that's how it goes. Um, so those are kind of my interests. I kind of gave up on Gestalt. That was one of those expressive therapies, you know, where you get to pound pillows, because I was working at Middlesex Hospital and I had some guy that had been referred to me um, by the courts, and I had him expressing his anger, you know, he's like, bang, bang, bang on the pillow, and a 38 falls out of his pocket, oh. and hits the floor, and I went, something's wrong with this picture. <laughs> I'm in it. <laughs> Wait, I'm not doing this shit anymore. <laughs> so would you say that uh, psychi psychiatry is more the chemical end of it in terms of our physiological makeups and neurotransmitters and psychotherapy and psychologists is more the behavioral end of it? That's a fair way of putting it. Yeah, I think there's probably some more nuances, but that's a nice way to look at it. I think that the psychiatry in this day and age, now there are certain psychiatrists that are like Freudian who still do analysis and Jungian and, and some things, but for the most part, they're really focusing on the biochemistry of what goes on. <laughs> And APRNs can do this, a similar kind of service as well. You get psychiatric APRNs, so, you know, uh, and physician's assistants. There's a few differences there, but it, they all can do the same thing with medication. And it really depends. I mean, uh, depending on your background, where you start doing psychotherapy. I mean, I, I started off at Middlesex Hospital, and um, I worked in inpatient and outpatient psychotherapy, started with chronic pain, <coughs> substance abuse, and schizophrenia. Now, don't ask me how we had those three things put together, but I had a psychiatrist that I worked for who was really brilliant. His name was Volandi Manohar, terrible sexist, but it didn't matter to me because I was male, so, you know, what could I say? Um, doesn't make it right, but I'm just saying, you know, it was kind of thing that went on. Um, but he was just brilliant. He was probably the best person I've known over the years in terms of titrating medication, especially with the elderly. He was brilliant. So, <clears throat> let me start with this. Probably 
I like to draw periodically. I'm an old teacher. I, I miss chalkboards, you know. I like getting an all over me and things. This is the world, right? the world we see. And probably Einstein's greatest question was, is the world a friendly place or not, right? And these are our points of view or perspectives that we might have. This is my college roommate, George. Now, I, I don't mean to offend anyone, but I, I periodically will swear, so if, uh, I, I won't drop any F-bombs on you, but just so you understand. My friend George, every morning, would get up and say, life is a shit sandwich, and every day we take another bite. He was a pleasure to be around. Thank <laughs> you. I can tell you, you know, he and I have been friends for 50 something years. And he uh, basically, actually over 50 years now, uh, a lot of therapy, a couple of marriages, a lot of medications. He's much better now. He really is. <laughs> he, uh, you know, he's not going to be a candidate for, you know, uh, you know, what's her name? Uh, <clears throat> uh, here's the other thing I should tell you. Both my parents died of dementia, so if I start losing things here, you know, just, uh, just don't worry. Um, Pollyanna? Yeah, Pollyanna would be a good one. I was thinking of Shirley Temple. I couldn't quite get it out uh, on the good ship Lollipop. You know, he, he never made it there. Uh, but he did, he did move away from this. And up here, I mean, we do have we'll have Shirley Temple or Pollyanna, you know. Everything is wonderful, you know. We just get our fingers caught in our dimples and everybody's really happy with everything that goes on. I hope that people can see both extremes but don't get stuck anywhere. I mean, it's nice to be up here and be manic sometimes, but we don't want to necessarily live there, right, all the time. This is a place you definitely don't want to be, you know. Nobody wants to be Debbie Downer. 24-7. Now, what is interesting is that all of these are moods, right? And what changes in terms of the moods are our attitudes. Now, do you know what attitudes are in, in flying? That is not that. Altitude. <laughs> altitude, but not attitude. <laughs> well, yeah, they, they kind of go. Attitude is actually the relationship, yes, exactly, between the wings and the horizon or the ground. So it has to do with our leanings towards the ground. And our attitudes are, are sort of similar. It's kind of like, what's our relationship to our grounding? And, you know, are we going to crash and burn? Or are we going to sort of soar? So one of the things that we're talking about is an attitude of gratitude as we go along. And the attitude is what lifts us up and down. And what we know in terms of all of this research is that gratitude is the single most important attitude you can have in terms of raising your level of mood. People that practice gratitude regularly, um, and I am not a neuroscientist, but I will tell you there are changes that happen to the brain in terms of the telemeters on the ends of the synapses that fire. People report better sleep, less anxiety, less depression. And it's not that hard to get to in terms of if we practice gratitude. And we'll kind of talk about how we can do that as we go along. <clears throat> But I want to start here just in terms of this because there's also a whole series of work that's being done by uh, uh, Brene Brown, and you may have heard of some of her work. And, and she is taking a look at what gratitude does in terms of shame and empathy in terms of the uh, thing that goes around uh, her kind of connection. And shame over here is based in, anchored in fear for the most part. And when you can move over to empathy, 
vulnerability. Well, yeah, the whole yeah. thing here is vulnerability, right? And how you deal with it. But empathy comes with compassion. As the other anchor. And how we move along here, again, she attributes gratitude to be one of the major forces for moving people along. And I think that's really important because a lot of work <coughs> in therapy often has to deal with shame, you know, and blaming and all that kind of thing. And we really need to be able to move out of this. One of the things that I um, work with a great deal is uh, PTSD, post-traumatic stress. Um, and I do that uh, not only in terms of just um, doing therapy, but I also do something called EMDR. And I do it as uh, bilateral tapping, which activates different parts of the brain uh, to release certain things. Uh, you know, like images. Uh, a classic case was a gentleman who had, um, was a rescue diver. But he went down on a recovery mission. And he went down and he had this truck and he's like playing with the door and trying to get it open. And he's cutting the seat belt and trying to turn the body so he can get it out to recover it. Head detached and floats into his mask. Recurring nightmares. Three sessions, EMDR. Gone. Because what happens is if this is the brain stem and this is the brain coming up here, this area here is the amygdala, right? This is where the fear, freeze, flight, all kind of go, and images get stuck. And if you can activate those images, you can get the frontal lobes to basically process that information, and you can free up those, all those things to do with the nightmares. Now, Myrna, you work in brain stuff, so you probably know more about this stuff than I do, but feel free to jump in and, and help me out. Okay. Um, so, one of the things that um, I should have mentioned earlier is that if you get natural nutmeg magazines, if you see yeah. it around, yeah. the issue coming out this Friday in this area, um, we'll have an article that where I started to talk about gratitude and its role in basically trauma and how we incorporate trauma in everyday life and how we begin to resolve it. So you know, it's a short read and it's probably not all that interesting, but it was fun to do, so humor me. One of the, th the th things to do with that article had to do with this, and that is that uh, I'd mentioned earlier that my parents had both uh, had dementia. And um, my father died about four years ago. My mother died just almost two years ago now. And she had Alzheimer's. He had a temporal frontal lobe dementia. And um, he had also had aphasia where he couldn't find language. <clears throat> so they both died at home, you know, the, what they did. But it started me to think, you know, what happens when we're faced with these kind of losses and trauma? What happens to us? And one of the things that's really interesting is that, you know, sometimes we're able to take that and really delve into life. You know, go like, oh, this is what's really important to me. What am I going to do? You know, what do I value? And then, <coughs> like, forget. You know, sort of like if we're driving down the road and we see this horrible car accident, right? Everybody slows down, plays nice, and they drive for about a half mile, maybe a mile, you know? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, yeah, it's like, boom, I hit the gas. Right? It's like, yeah, we, we don't get that part. Because you know it's true. <laughs> yeah. And what we miss is the fragility of life. And so one of the things that I was playing with in this article is how do we how do we understand the fragility of life and sort of commit ourselves to it? And the key to that, actually, in my opinion, comes down to gratitude. So this was all related, trust me. And so um, that's the first sort of 
question that we deal with here, and that is, what's important to you? What do you value? Right? And once you have that kind of thing, then how you live your life in terms of being responsible to those values is going to work out. Am I making sense so far? Mm -hmm. I'm not always sure. So just check me in. So, <clears throat> I'll give you a couple of examples. How many of you, when you were a kid, remember playing uh, things like uh, mazes? You know, you get the things and you kind of like fill them up. How did you solve those? Trial and error. Trial and error. So you start at the beginning. Some people are looking back. Like, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I think we did the same thing. I started at the other end. Me too. Yeah. And I worked yeah. backwards, right? And what I found is that that's a nice little metaphor, if you will for what we need to do. If we know what, I, what we value, if we know what is important to us, then every place along the line where we're stuck, we can make the right choice, <clears throat> right? Sometimes I do couples therapy, not very often, because I'm, um, well, let me put it this way. I got into real, I used to be the clinical director for Catholic Charities. I used to get these calls from the Archbishop who just go like, I'm sending you over somebody and to save their marriage. And I was like, you want me to send them to somebody else? No, I, guess, I don't do that. I don't save marriages, I'm sorry. I'm interested in people being healthy, right? And so I'm a little bit like Woody Allen, you know, when they're sitting in uh, Annie Hall and they talk about the, a relationship being like a shark, it always has to be moving forward. You got a dead shark buried. It, you know, so if you're making it to my office, chances are you got a dead shark and we're not going to have a lot of fun, you know. I'm going to send you off somewhere else because that's not what I do. But if you're in a relationship and you're making it to my office and what you've said is, these are the things that are important. Fidelity is something important. Telling the truth is something important. And then you tell me that every step along the way, you don't act on those things and don't tell me that these things are important to you, right? Because it all has to tra translate into action and behavior. And if it doesn't do that, then it's meaningless, right? And so I don't play that game really well, you know? It's like if you tell me one thing and you're doing something else, you know, we're not gonna make it. So are you of the mindset that actions really do speak louder than words? Yes. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I'll take, give you an example of this. Um, I worked with a nurse. Um, I worked for United Technologies for a while. <clears throat> and uh, she was a really, um, I, I just love this lady. Anyway, her name was Gladys. Gladys uh, comes in and uh, she's got a broken arm and a black eye. And I'm looking at her and I go, like, what happened? She said, I fell down the stairs. Gladys, I've known you for three years now. I've watched you walk up and down the stairs. Who pushed you? And she says, my boyfriend, but he really loves me. Now, I have to tell you, that doesn't work for me, right? Love is not pushing somebody down a flight of stairs. I don't care how you, how you phrase that. That doesn't work, right? So, yeah, I, I have to say that I do look at behavior. I want to look at behavior in context, but behavior is probably the most important thing. The other thing is that, in terms of some of the work that I did, I also worked for the Department of Developmental Services. So I worked with mostly the families, but also individuals that had intellectual and developmental disabilities. And I can tell you that behavior, which is what I end up writing sometimes our behavior plans, for people with autism and that kind of stuff, they have to be anchored in positive things. <clears throat> Can't be anchored in this, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna whack you on the hand every time you don't do X, Y, or Z. And hopefully you don't make them so that everything is related to food, because otherwise you've got everybody that's running around, you know, with an eating disorder <laughs> afterwards, you know, no need that either. So you have to do positive, reinforcing positive behaviors as we go. You can't reinforce negative somebody down a flight of stairs. 
So I digress. So, <clears throat> so let me tell you a little bit about um, a couple of things in, in terms of uh, people that I've known over the years in terms of gratitude. I worked with a fellow by the name, he was one of my mentors, his name was Lee Silverstein, and we ran a treatment center in Greece. And it was primarily um, a lot of substance abuse, where people from really all over the world would come to work with us, and a lot of depression, which was sort of related in some ways. Um, but that's who the groups that would come to us. And Lee um, would, every time he would leave, the island, because we lived on the island of Skiathos, he'd write everybody notes, right? How important they were to him, what was meaningful, you know, how he valued them. And the first time I got one of these notes, I was like, it's <laughs> like, Lee, what are you doing here, you know? And uh, he'd say, Jim, it's important. You got to say things to people. You got to let them know what's going on. I'm like, yeah, okay. And then I'd say, I know, I know, and I know. And he'd give me one of those Jethro Gibbs kind of slaps in the back of the head because, you know, he'd say, to know and not to do is not to know kind of thing, right? So I stopped saying, I know, I know, I know to him. <laughs> <laughs> one day, Lee leaves and goes to Germany to do a workshop. Lee never comes back because he gets diagnosed with terminal cancer, a blood disorder kind of he comes back to the United States. So I did get to visit him in the States. Uh, but I continued to stay in Greece. And um, the one thing is everybody knew where they stood with Lee because he had written every note. He had taken every opportunity to say how you were important to him. And when I came over to the States, one of the things that he had a, a daughter and uh, she was two, just about two and a half at the time. We sat and made videotapes for every one of her birthdays until she was 21, where he would developmentally say where he hoped she would be and what she was doing and have her life, you know? And of course, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. I mean, I think about it now, I still get kind of you know, emotional. But that's so critical in terms of what we're doing in terms of, say, of gratitude. And I guess if I had to pick somebody that I've known in my life that has done that, he's sort of the image of, of, what, of what that is. There's a, um, there's a Benedictine brother, and his name is uh, David Stendhal Ross. I know Oprah's met with him. There's some stuff on YouTube you can see. I think he's 93 years old, still alive, still lecturing, mostly on gratitude. And he's a good Benedictine because there's the rule of Benedictine. Uh, if you're familiar with it, always keep death before you rise. And that is a way of grounding yourself in terms of understanding that life is transitory. Right? I know, we all know that, right? All you have to do is look at the seasons, right? Everything changes. And what happens is that, going back to what we were talking about a little or I was talking about a little earlier, we can get forgetful. But if you really keep in, your, in the foremost of your head that everything you know is going to pass, how do you stay involved with it in the moment? And so this is the key to developing, if you will, gratitude. It's, and the way he uh, will talk to uh, about it, it is to stop, look, go. By stop, what he means is come to the present moment. 
be here now. Take and really focus on what's happening with your exchanges with people. You know? Are you looking them in the eye? Are you breathing? Are you not thinking about dinner next Thursday with somebody else? You know? Are you being here? I always like that line from Ram Dass, be here now. He was uh, an interesting nutcase, and I really admired him in so many ways. I also liked his other line that he left, which was, you know, we're all just walking each other home. You know? And he did a lot of work with uh, hospice. Anyway, so be here now. Be present. Meditate. Do all the things that you need to do. Look is, again, paying attention, listening, using your senses to be engaged in this moment. And go, I think you'll like this one, is what kind of action are you going to take that supports that? And that's probably it in a nutshell. You know? So what do you do in terms of yourselves in terms of creating a foundation for gratitude? What kind of things do you do? <clears throat> well, personally, I believe gratitude is an action, so <clears throat> I don't always... So I'm, I'm in recovery myself, and in early recovery, um, you know, I may not have woken up feeling grateful, but I would get up, go to a meeting, put my hand out to someone else, and my action was my, my saying, I'm grateful for my sobriety, and I'm reaching out even though inside my heart doesn't always feel grateful. Um, so for me, I think it's an action word. Today, you know, um, I've been sober many years now, and I run a recovery community center, and I, the center is um, volunteers. There's only two paid staff, the rest of the center is volunteers and they come in and every single volunteer everything they like at the end of every day or in the middle of whatever they're doing I always say thank you for being here today I so appreciate everything you've done for me you know and and they feel my gratitude you know and they and and I and I know that they're grateful to be a part of the center and it's like we're a family we're a team you know and it's a, it's a beautiful thing but even in my personal life I always so for me, the stop is, you know, keep my head where my feet are. You know, try not to worry about what's going on yesterday or what I need to worry about next week. I try to be present with people. You know, when you have a lot of loss in your life, it helps you to do that better because I'm kind of the emotional one in the family that I never miss an opportunity to let somebody know I love them. In fact, we had some news today about a doctor visit, and I called them, and it it's causing me a little bit of anxiety because now I'm a little afraid because um, we have to wait. And I called a friend and said, I just got some news today and it just made me think I wanted to make sure everyone in my life knows how much I love them. And I just called a friend who lives in Rhode Island just to connect. And, and people know that about me like every day. I will say thank you for being here. Thank you for what you did in the house tonight or because it's important. It's important. When you have a lot of loss, you may not get another opportunity to do that. Exactly. So. Thank you for sharing that kind of stuff. And I don't mean that in a, in a trite way. I mean, that what you're doing is really important. And and 12-step programs have a way of starting with basically gratitude. I mean, I love the first step, which is basically take yourself out of the center of the universe, you know, and pay attention to what's going on. And realize that you can't do everything in, by yourself. And you need help and the support and acceptance and love of other people so you can heal. So, thanks for that. Yeah, one of the things that you learn in, in those 12 step programs, if you will, and other places is this. You probably learn a lot of different things, but I'm gonna start with this. And that is, First thing is recognizing what it is you feel. And this is a way of beginning to express gratitude. I feel when and it means to me. 
Nobody can tell you how you feel. That's an internal process. Only you know what that is, right? Mothers were great at this. I really feel sick today. No, you don't. <laughs> now, I'll tell you what an asshole I was, right? I was in fifth grade. We, and uh, I grew up on a farm. And um, <clears throat> we were playing football, waiting for the bus. I, I think it was detained or something, but you know. And Tommy fell on my arm. I heard it break. Oh. I felt it break. I'll be damned if I was going to cry. Right? So I kind of get up, pony up, go to the bus monitor and say, Tommy fell on my arm and uh, broke it. No, he didn't get on the bus. <laughs> so I get home, right? My mother's like, go do your homework. We're going to have it. I was like, no, Tommy fell on my arm and broke it. No, he didn't. You know, go do your homework. <laughs> So this is what this jerk does. I go into the room, I throw my arm over the side of the bed, right? A couple hours later, my father comes up and is like calling me. And I didn't miss a lot of meals when I was a kid, and I still don't miss many meals, right? <laughs> so I'm not coming out. And he comes to the door and he just about breaks it down. I mean, my father was a really interesting guy. Uh, I didn't realize that French doors had handles on them until I was about 16. I just thought you threw you know, people through them, but uh, anyway. So I get up, <clears throat> now I'm pulling my arm up, right? It's blue, it's swollen, you know? And he comes in and he goes, ah! I said, I told Ma, nobody ate dinner that night. We <laughs> 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 all went down to the Britain General Hospital and waited in the emergency room for a long time. Yeah. <clears throat> People can't tell you how you feel. They might say, you know, if I said to somebody, and I'm singing, and I'm dancing, and I'm carrying on, I'd say, you know, I'm really suicidal. I don't really feel uh, like I'm going to make it through the night. You might say to me, God, you don't act that way. But you can't tell me I'm not feeling that way. Right? What is really helpful is people can debate the meaning that we put to something. So, give you an example. I worked with a, a, a woman who was a great mentor to me, uh, doing some employee assistance programs. But she would come in and she would say, listen, we're gonna do a training, it's gonna be at an insurance company, it's gonna be about an hour long, they're gonna give us, figure we're gonna lose 10 minutes on either side, I want you to do something didactic, we're gonna really get it done, and um, so figure, you know, you got a good 40 minutes, uh, 20 minutes, Put something together. Okay, and we used to do a lot of this stuff, so it was kind of cut and paste and do things. I, she comes back the next day. Did you get to work on that? Yeah, okay, here. No, she walks out of the room. No is not my favorite word. I don't know about the rest of you, but you know, then, no, no was not the word. And <clears throat> she would come back in and I decided, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start the I fairly feel really angry and upset when you ask me to do something and then you come back in and say no and then you come back like a, another hour later and say yeah we can do this this and this and that's good but <clears throat> you're driving me crazy and what it means to me is you don't value the word you don't trust me but blah 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 I don't know what I was going on with my interpretation she stops me dead in my tracks she said that's not what I meant like I would know right and she said, she goes into this long explanation about how she grew up in uh, Miami. And she lived in a um, hotel. I didn't know people lived in hotels. Uh, and her father played the uh, dogs and the ponies. Right? So he would come in, and basically, everything was no. Right? No, you're not taking the food money. No, you're not taking the piggy bank. No, you're not taking anything out of the house to pawn. No. Because you can always come back from no. You know, you put it out here. I mean, there's a reason we do say no. So, my and my infinite wisdom say to her, you know, it'll work a lot better for me. Why don't you just say, I'll take a look at this and I'll get back to you later. And she goes, oh, yeah, I can do that. I misunderstood. You know, 
misinterpreted her responses. Right? And we do that a lot sometimes. But we need to preserve how it is that we're feeling. We need to be able to express that and not have it denied. Because that's crazy making for anybody. This is why when, I'm sorry, what's your name? Rita. Rita. When Rita says to people, I'm grateful that you're here. When you show up and you do this work, what it means to me, it's valuable and it, you, it demonstrates caring or whatever thing that goes on here. It's critical because people get to finish the loop. They get to understand, have their feelings uh, validated. <coughs> validated and means that they're also being understood. If you learn nothing else, you know, and this is not original to me, don't think that. I mean, every <coughs> therapist in the universe probably has used this. You know, I feel when and it means to me. It is important in terms of expressing who we are and relating to people. It's getting connectedness. I mean, when we were talking down here with some of uh, Brene Brown's work, it is that connectivity that is, is critical. Because what else is there between people? It's, it's us, between people. OK. And as you're wondering, I'm just doing a little time check here, because I, I talk too much sometimes. Um, any questions over? Yeah, I just got a quick question, because you know today's um, uh, environment, there's a lot of millennials who are glued to their cell phones and their technology so much to the point that it's almost like they don't have empathy, they don't make eye contact. So my question to you is how do you deal with a generation raised on technology that can't even make eye contact with you and are totally um, detached from their feelings and their human qualities? How do you, how do you deal with that and do you see that? Well, you know how to go right for the juggler, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's come up in my, you know, my life, and I'm sure everybody else's, and it must be uh, striking to somebody like you yeah. in your field. Well, I have a grandson who's on the spectrum. Yeah. So it's like living with Donald Trump, 24/7. So if you're Trump supporters, you know you can all leave now. It's okay. I won't. No, I won't it's be fine. offended. <laughs> but it is really difficult when someone is just so self-absorbed and isn't paying attention and is out of touch with the natural order of things, the natural world. You know? That is, uh, it is difficult. And this is how we start. This is how I start, to talk about feelings, you know, to have experiences to in, get some kind of an engagement. Right? And once you start with that, um, there's hope. <coughs> Most people understand suffering, you know, because even, especially people on the spectrum, you know, which I'm uh, just I'm not saying any, that millennials are on the spectrum, but let's just use that as a, as an example, know when things aren't right. And if they can be engaged, you know, in a really heartfelt way, sometimes it's it's just beginning with touch, if they can tolerate touch, <coughs> to make connection. It's really, that's the journey of ramp. See, that's just the issue, is it's not just people on the spectrum. No. I consider a lot of you go down to any college town, and I, even where I work, I consider them, I call them walking zombies mm -hmm. because they're completely out of touch. They're being denatured by their technology. They think they're a machine having an electronic experience instead of a human being having a spiritual experience mm -hmm. while they're here. And they've totally denatured all their human senses, even to the point where they don't even have the social skills to go to a supervisor and say, this is wrong as long as their little world is in their little whatever they do. You know, when you have adults,
who are not on the spectrum, who are walking around and cannot pull themselves from their technology, there's something wrong. So how do you get those people who are supposedly normal back to their true normal? That's the new normal. That's the normal for that. That is the think we're abnormal. Yeah, we're not on our phones enough. I could just uh, yeah. flip out there. I mean, I don't have an answer for that. What I do is I try to play with people, right? Try to engage them in some way. Uh, it might do. Can, get I, on can I? You know, I'm, there's no answer. I'm not. I don't yeah. have anyone's answers for anyone else. I can tell you that we have kids, and um, our son was. You know, that's this is a generation they're raised in, and. Um, I find ways to connect so so he likes electronics he likes um, to make music on electronics so I'll find any way to I'll, I'll learn all about what he likes to do with his electronics and we'll spend time with so now he makes a playlist for us at Christmas and he tells us why he likes each individual song or we'll say to him what do you do on that thing all day can you show us and he'll say well actually I taught myself how to code I'm creating this video game so you know the world is different today I think you know a lot of times they use those things because it's a pretty scary world out there for a kid and they learn to they learn to remove themselves completely with their electronics it works for them I don't like it but we've been on the end of where we've given them a grief and it just pushes them further away. So now I'll do anything I can to learn about his world and I'll engage with him in any possible way. And when I do that, he, they, they come to us. They, well, we do this music program. So we bought him this music program and now he shares with us what he's doing on his, you know, he, he makes TikTok videos, but he hasn't blocked us out. He told us about it and showed us how to get an account and we can watch the video. So. I try. We try to connect with them any possible way we can because I, I do, I agree a lot. I don't like what I see in the world, and I think we need connection. But I also know that there's a reason why they find safety in that, and and um, I just try to try to find a way to kind of connect with them. When you have That's them all. one on one and they're on their phone and you're in the car with them, you could use the I feel thing. Yeah, in a nice totally. Way. Yeah, I really feel like you know. I would like to talk to you. Yeah. You know, when you're on the phone all the time, I can't do that. It makes me feel like you know we're not connected. Yeah, you know, great. You think Perfect. you should put the phone down for a little while? You know, I, this is fine because we're adults and you're speaking, I assume, of children. No, well, no, they're, they're 19, no, 20, 20, 20, 20 themselves. Yeah, 20. No. Right. See, but that's anyway, just an right. issue. These are adults. Right. We're grateful when they get off the phone. It's about <laughs> grateful. That's right. That's right. Well, that's right. The other thing yeah. is, I'm with you. Know, you. The old thing that we used to always do, why don't you invite somebody to dance? <laughs> right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, people move. We're still human, you know? Music, music moves people in ways. You know, in terms of, you talked about a spiritual journey. Uh, remember St. Ambrose, right? To sing is to pray twice, right? Because you just kind of get into this stuff. All right. So you're kind of getting the idea. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, to finish up that maze uh, yeah. analogy, mm -hmm. it's where we're going. At that one, one of my favorite things, uh, sometimes uh, it's under duress even, is where are we going with this? Mm -hmm. and, and the behavior, I, you know, I, I feel very good about what you've said so far about gratitude and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, but and back to the maze is. You look at the end of it because where do you want to be? Is it going to be constantly, you know, when you check yourself, um, you know, are you calling names like someone you mentioned earlier? <laughs> where is that going? It doesn't end well. It's not sustainable. The love and the compassion is sustainable. That's what's going to lift people, not, uh, not the negativism. So where do you want to be? It's That's the most distressing thing with uh, that's going on in the country now is is the the negativism isn't what made the country great for, uh, for starters well yeah working with the negative do you remember when the space shuttle um, exploded yeah mm -hmm. right. afterwards they did all these kind of really wonderful investigations and they kind of like paraded everybody out so they brought out this one engineer who had said, don't launch. 
and the congressmen were like, what did you know that nobody else knew? And he looks at me and says, I didn't know anything that nobody else knew. I just simply knew that we ran a series of tests at low temperature and all the results were away from the good. And I heard that for the first time as an engineering term, away from the good, is what we're doing moving us to where we want to be or is it moving us away? And that's the, that's the key, I think, to the behaviors. You know, where are we going? Are we going towards the good or away from the good? And I don't think you stand still. We like to tell ourselves we stand still, but you don't. You're either moving forward or you're moving backwards, right? Right. You don't stay stagnant. It's just... No. We're <clears throat> constantly in motion. Right? And, and if we are standing still, the world is not, right? Everything changes. I have, sometimes I tell stories because people remember them better, right? So there was this fellow by the name of Peter Chang. He used to run a, a restaurant down in New Haven in the 70s, was, uh, into the early 80s. It was called the Mandarin House. People would be out and in front of the street, down the uh, block past where um, the uh, YMCA was around the corner from partners, I mean, just all the way down, right? They'd be out there waiting to get in. And Peter would go up and he'd put a closed sign on the door on Friday night. Or you'd order something and Peter would go, I got no cook. <clears throat> and Peter, being from China, you know, everybody in China shares meals, right? Not like some of my experience with a lot of my American friends who like sit down and everybody orders their own meal and then they eat it. <laughs> they don't share it, you know? And with Chinese food, I, the first time that happened to me, I was in a, a group uh, that went out afterwards, you know, it was a therapy group. And uh, I'm like, tasting the food, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, they ordered this and this. So I ordered something that would complement it, and then I didn't get to eat any of the other stuff. I was like furious, you know? I was like, oh man, what, what's wrong with these people? Well, Peter had a way of not holding on to much staff especially when somebody would order something and he'd send them out something else because he didn't want to cook whatever they ordered. <laughs> <laughs> so my friend uh, uh, Susie um, was going to school and uh, at Southern and she was getting a teaching uh, degree and worked with him and her friend Pat, uh, Pam, they, they were always there and she was having, she had a baby. Right? And Peter wanted to see the baby. And so Susie had a real sense of humor. Right? She had to have a sense of humor because baby was born with his, her father's nose. Literally took up her entire face, right? And she had this red hair. I mean, she looked like an orangutan. <laughs> now, she goes down to see Peter, right? So she pushes the carriage down, come, comes in, comes in. Peter's in the back of the kitchen, comes out, looks at the baby. <laughs> Looks at Susie. Suzanne, no worry. Everything change. He turned around and walked away. <laughs> and of course, everything did change. She grew into her nose. She was beautiful. She had the strawberry blonde hair. She went into all kinds of interesting things. Got a full ride to Rutgers, you know. A few years later, she had a, daughter, uh, a sister, uh, Corey. Corey was born with blonde hair. Her father's nose and looked like a kitten. But everything changes. You know? <laughs> everything does change. Does it change for the better? I don't know. That's where we have to be responsible and take action, right? And responsibility means a lot of different things, right? It means eating well. It means exercising. It means being engaged with people. That's being responsible <coughs> for who we are looking after our own health, being concerned about the plight of other people. That's all being responsible. Right? Speaking our truth as we understand it, being open to the ideas that perhaps what we need to do is change our thought processes. We could be wrong, heaven forfend, but it's possible we could be wrong about our interpretation of things, right? 
that had to do with the perspective that we were doing. You know, there's a wonderful <coughs> story about this uh, family on a sinking ship, right? And the uh, mother uh, is giving the baby to the father, and uh, he's getting off the ship. And she's staying on the ship, to, and it's going down. Everybody looks at that little picture scenario going on and goes like, what a slime ball, right? He's taking the kid and he's leaving her to die. But what you don't know in the context of that story is that she has a terminal illness and she's going to die within a month. And they were on this cruise because they were celebrating her life. If he doesn't take the baby, the baby has nobody. Right? Sometimes our interpretation of what we think we see is really wrong. So that's what being responsible is also about. It's about trying to find the truth and working through it with people. Boy, I feel like I've been lecturing the shit out of people. I'm sorry. <laughs> talk more about gratitude and how you get it. Yeah. When you Let feel down you. and depressed and you just don't want to live anymore, what do you say to somebody oh, like that? Good one. Well, first thing. things that I wanted to get to. I'm going to give you some cards. And if you don't have pens, don't worry. You can still keep the cards. <laughs> One each, or? Eh, I don't care. It's, 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 there's just cards. You know? uh, so one of the things in terms of gratitude is coming back to this stuff express it every time you get a shot, right? Every chance you have, say thank you and mean it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, everybody here. I got friends. She knows I always have at least two. Oh, you got at least two. Okay. <laughs> well, you may want to, because I'm going to turn something over in a minute, and you might want to write some of it down. First thing is keeping a gratitude journal. Right? This is what I used to say. Every day, three to five things you write down that you're grateful for that day. Now, everybody starts off, I'm grateful for my partner, I'm grateful for my children, and I'm grateful for my job. <coughs> Stop it! <laughs> what I want you to be grateful for are the simple things in life. Keep it simple. I inherited a dog from my daughter. She came up to help with my parents. And uh, I rented her a place, and she couldn't uh, have the dog, so I inherited Matilda. And uh, Matilda was, I, I, I love this dog to death. It's too bad that she has uh, brain damage and can't be a therapy dog, but you know, she's, she's really sweet. But at 5 o'clock in the morning, uh, her idea was she had to go outside, mm -hmm. right? And it was springtime. And you know how we get those days where it snows, mm -hmm. and you wake up in the morning, you open the door, and it's just covered in snow? By the end of the day, it's gone. But it's like, and I'm thinking, well, of course, I was grateful that she didn't, you know, mess up the Oriental rug, you know, that I had next to the door, which shows you where, how bright I was, right? But that's kind of, you know. And I look out, and I look down in the garden, and I see this one purple crocus just sticking up through the snow. And I went, holy shit, maybe there's hope. You know? It's the simple things that you look for. I'll give you another good example. I was working, as I said, for DDS, and I went down and I was to consult with a, a therapist down at Yale about a, a case that they were working on. Now, the person never showed up, which is not a surprise. Didn't show up. So I go over and I meet with this therapist who was about 63, 64 years old, about six foot tall, white hair, dressed in black. She floated across the floor. She was just amazing. I mean, I looked at her and I was like, oh my God, you know, so graceful. You know, 
And that's really the thing. She just had such grace. And it turned out her husband had died a couple of years ago, and she took up uh, professional, uh, or not professional, but competitive ballroom dancing. Right? So we had this really lovely conversation, consulted about the guy, and I left. Now, I wasn't doing so well. I'm walking with a cane. I have back problems you know, at the time. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going down, and I'm leaving what was basically the front of the hospital, going to the Ayers Garage, which if you're familiar with New Haven, it's the one that goes across Temple Street. So I'm crossing Frontage Road, and this guy sees me coming. I'm like 50, 60 yards away from the guy, but he holds the door. And then he goes down the hall, and he's holding the elevator, right? I'm still waddling my ass down here, and I'm going like this, right? I get to the end, he says, what floor? And I'm going to five, you'd already hit three. So I tell him, you know, I'm really grateful that he held the door and all this kind of stuff, because what it really meant to me, because this guy was about 36 to 42, African-American, built like he lived in the gym, right? Now he's looking at me like I'm hitting on him, right? And he's not real happy about it, right? But he goes, I said, no, man, in this day and age, when there's so much hostility going around and there's so much race nonsense, I just want you to know how much I appreciate what you just did for me, you know? We get to three, he gives me a fist bump when he's getting off the elevator. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about, okay? That's what I want you to pay attention to. And, you know, research is funny, right? Because I always thought three to five things every day, boom, boom, boom. Well, research shows that it, you probably don't need to do it that often. But start that way anyway. Once a week, if you put something down that you're really grateful for and you write out it about with some length, you know, more than five sentences, you know, about what it meant to you, it's probably just as effective in terms of changing behavior as doing what I'm talking about. But start there, right? Start a gratitude list for yourself. Other ways that you can kind of uh, do things is, is beginning with meditation. Now, if you don't do meditation, just do breath work, you know? And if you, like my mother, just take up sighing. Sighing was good, you know? It <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> does make it feel better. Well, it does. Because really, what breath work is really about, and I use four, four, eight. I tell people, take a breath for the count of four, hold it to the count of four, exhale to the count of eight. What that does is it activates your sympathetic nervous system, that long exhale really just kind of heightens it, right? <clears throat> I also tell people, do not tattoo it on your hand. Because I had a client do that, right? He said it was so effective, and I'm like, you don't have a magic marker, you had to have it tattooed on your hand, you know? I mean, I could think of having a lot of other things tattooed on your body, but 448 was not one of them, you know what I'm saying? Just me. I, I don't want you to think I don't, I'm not without judgment. I, I am. Alright. So, um, one of the things that, um, you know, I talked about with Lee is writing notes. I mean, a really heartfelt, thoughtful recognition of what you're grateful for with an individual. The other thing you might want to consider is, um, I used to teach at Southern, and uh, I taught philosophy, I taught ethics. I kind of gave up it after a while because people were cheating on the final exam. How do you cheat on the <laughs> ethics exam? Really, you know, I mean, just. And then they argue with me when I'm picking up their exams and I'm ripping them up, you know, these little blue books we used to have. I was like, really? It's not, we're not even having a conversation about this. You failed. That's it. So, Anyway, um, I carry three by five cards with me, and I still do, although I have bigger cards now. Um, and, you know, I'd write stuff down, and I'd put it in my pocket, and then I could come back, and I could kind of revisit things. But if you carry things like that, three by five cards or something like that, write stuff down and give it to people. Go like, damn, I really appreciate what you did, you know? You, and for something, it might be as easy as, 
you put down the phone and came to dinner, man. And we actually had a little bit of a conversation. One of the things that Brene Brown started to do with her family in terms of wanting to, to create some gratitude is that they did grace. Now some people you know, do grace for every meal. <coughs> Incorporated in that, what are you thankful for today? And when she stopped, you know, they had to go somewhere. The family, the kids started like, oh, no, no, we have to say what we were grateful for today. She was like, I want to get out of the house. But no, you know, she, but she stopped and, and, and did these things. Those are the things that are key. Remember that gratitude comes from the Latin gratis, right? Which is also related to gratia, which is the root for grace. So gratitude and grace are tightly linked, you know? So, thinking where I want to go next. <laughs> um, the other thing in terms of going back to one of the things that I had mentioned earlier was always keeping the perspective of, you know, keeping death before your eyes, you know, knowing that we really need to do something in these moments that makes the connection, that supports life, that supports what we value that's important. So one of the things that I did, and I, you probably can't read my handwriting because I generally can't, I was in court one day. I had to, uh, it was a DCF case, and I was there actually to support DCF on some level. But the attorney was such a, an incredible, um, vicious human being that she said to me, you will only answer questions yes or no. And then she asked me a question that I couldn't possibly answer yes or no, you know, so it was kind of but in the course of that thing, the judge says to me, uh, Mr. Osborne, uh, I have your notes here. Can you read them? And I looked at them and I said, uh, no, Your Honor, I can't. And she said, I suspected as much. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're dismissed. So if you can't read my handwriting, but this is the thing I thought you might want to play with on your cards and take home. Identify three things that you appreciate and really be specific about it. Right? It's a way to identify, you know, what's meaningful to you. Three things that you take for granted. You know, sometimes we just think, oh, you know, that'll always be there. But then, what's the most important thing you take for granted every day? And you're going to get up. up. Getting up, yeah. <laughs> Breathing. Right. Right. That's what Woody Allen's famous line, right? I don't mind dying, I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> One of the things that people often don't do, what are three things that you appreciate about yourself? Because one of the things is we have to love ourselves as well. Right? We have to identify those core things that are important to us. What are your three things about, that you appreciate about yourself? Uh, most of the time I'm funny. <laughs> I think that I'm loving. And um, I would like to say I was a good dancer, but that's not true. Mm -hmm. uh, I, um, and this sounds arrogant, but I, I think I have a good mind, you know, in terms of, uh, of the, the way I, th I think. And I also really um, try my best to always be present with people. Which is sometimes, you know, this is one of the things that uh, when people, in this day and age, you know, you go to a therapist, you know, everybody's on a clock. I'm not real good about clocks. Um, you know, I, if I'm with somebody, you know, I could be over an hour. And people have to know when they come to see me, they know that I'm gonna do the same thing for them, right? Like if I open somebody up, um, I want to make sure they're closed before they walk out of their room, right? Or because I work a lot with trauma, for example, 
you know, something can come up if I'm doing an evaluation that was totally unexpected, you know, some kind of real grief or trauma. And, you know, the next person, if they're, I'm trying to, I have two practices. I have pro-natural, and then I have another place that I'm opening at, uh, uh, in town up on uh, New Britain Road. When I schedule there, I'm going to actually schedule uh, an hour and a half so that I have some recovery time. And I don't have people waiting, thinking like, what's this more I'm doing, you know? Because it's, I understand that it's unfair. All right. What are three things that you're grateful for right now? Like, I'm grateful for those people who actually showed up here tonight. That's like cool. Three people that were sig are significant in your life and how they make or made you feel. Now in this exercise, the next part is that you're going to create a thank you note for them, for those three people. You actually write out. Don't necessarily have to send it to them, you know, but that you actually sit down and say, this is why you're meaningful to me, right? So these are ways, some of the ways that you can start to play with gratitude. And it, it's like anything else, you know? It, it's called practice, right? It's like meditation, it's called practice. Prayer, it's called practice. Because you have to do it over and over and over again every day, right? And it's important that you do that. And it doesn't take that much effort to say thank you. It doesn't take a lot of effort to just go like. Can I have your attention, please? The elevator will be closing in approximately five minutes. <laughs> uh -oh. No. Uh -oh. No free rides up and down anymore. <laughs> Does anybody need the elevator? No. Um, and let's see what else I want to say. Oh, this is another exercise that is sort of interesting that you can incorporate. And that is to uh, pay attention to what do you hate to do. Write that down. Oh, I hate getting up in the morning. That'd be my grandson. You know, I, I want you to drive me to Hartford every day because I can't possibly get on the van. Keep dreaming. And then once you've identified what it is that you hate, find the opportunity that's in it. What's hidden there? What's the gem? Because right? there's always something that we can find that kind of gets us going, right? And if we believe that everything is a lesson, which I happen to do, then what am I learning from these things? Right. You'll love this one, but keep it simple. Right. Yes. <laughs> it's really in the simple things of life that we see the most beautiful stuff. Right? It's that little purple carcass, you know? It's the gesture of somebody hitting a second hand. It is the simple things of just being appreciated and respected. You know? It doesn't have to be complicated. I used to say at work, because I worked at a place that wasn't very nice to me sometimes. Mm -hmm. Everyone's had, had that experience, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say, Jesus. Why can't they just say something nice to you once in a while, like what you're doing right? I mean, you, I'm not really that interested in money. I like money, but, you know, you know is it a $20,000 raise, or are you going to just, you know, tell me how great I am every once in a while? You know, you're doing a great job with the kids here, and, you know, why don't they do that? I don't you know. get bosses that have a bug up their butt every other day. I mean, really, they could save a lot of money. They, they don't have to give everybody a raise. <laughs> I think you know, it is because we are inbred in a certain way. Uh, listen to this. Most of the time, people start to look at what's wrong with the picture. 
right? Mm -hmm. We have to fault find, or we have to find out what Colonel said. Now, back in the day of being cavemen, it was really helpful to remember if I go right, there's a saber-toothed tiger that's down the road, but I don't want to go there because he like ate most of my relatives. <laughs> right? So, you know, we pay attention for survival to like what's wrong, and let's not do that. We have to train ourselves to go like what's right. But these are the big bosses that you know they're administrators and they should be smart and they should know these things. Oh really? Yeah, well, they should. <laughs> Pollyanna, that's me. Yeah, yeah they should you know. know. You know, just, I've heard that uh, that's a, articulated before that people would rather would rather be appreciated than uh, given a, 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 a raise. Absolutely. No, know that. No, not me. Know that there were. Me too. Were, and consequently, then is more valuable than. Yeah. It, it is to be valued. The money in and of itself is not a value. I mean, it, it's we've kind of made it that way, but to be embraced is really important. I, I, you're absolutely right. And here, um, <clears throat> yeah, well, I lost my train of thought. It was something you said too that uh, I wanted to. Why don't they know? Oh, to yeah. manage people. So one of the things tell them everything they're doing wrong. Yeah. You're going to like this. See, uh, when I worked for the United Technologies, we, United Technologies had its own day treatment program for substance abuse. It wasn't out of the generosity of their heart. They were self-insured. Uh, so back in the 70s and 80s um, and into the 90s, um, we used to send people to what was called euphemistically the Irish Alps. So mm -hmm. um, in Vermont and New Hampshire, there were a number of of 30-day treatment programs that cost an arm and a leg to put people through, right? So they decided they would open their own day treatment program. And um, it was interesting and, and helpful because they figured they could put people through that, um, you know, multiple times for what it would cost them for the one time and they weren't getting the best results. One of the people that ran that program uh, and ran some of the family uh, components of it used to um, not hit, what do you call it? Crochet. No, when you do needlepoint. Needlepoint, needle point, thank you. And she had a wonderful thing that, that was in her office and it said, don't <coughs> should all over yourself. <laughs> and I looked at that and I went like, yeah. Yeah, shoulds, I don't know about shoulds. Yeah. Well, because they're always you should do this. You should well, do somebody this. else isn't going to beat you up. You beat yourself up. Right. Yeah, how bad is that? I should have done this for this person. I should have done more. I should have, should have, should have. You're right. It's not good. So one of the things that we have to go with gratitude then, and I mean, it's, it's part of the package, is forgiveness. Right? We have to look at, we're not going to know everything, but what is, how do we forgive ourselves and accept this is where we are now, and this is where we want to go. We have a goal. How do we get there without doing all of the beating of ourselves? Because that, that's a no-win situation. It's a no-win game. Well, sort of danced with gratitude in some ways here. Uh, probably other ways that it could have been done, but we did it this way for now, so uh, play. If you have Thank questions, you that. I'd like to, uh, you know, I'll stay after and answer things if you don't, if you have to go, um, and entertain questions. But I want to do. But here's the other thing. I'm going to do this real quick too. And I told you that I um, <laughs> language also shapes the world that we see. Okay. And one of the words that is my pet peeve. Some of you know. In philosophy, there's a um, school of uh, thought uh, or study called ordinary language philosophy. And it really dates back to logic and putting things together. It's not particularly original, even though in the 20th century, everybody thought it was. But this fellow by the name of Strawson, 
who would take sentences and then diagram them like they were mathematical, right? And so he would kind of get something going along and then somebody would go, but, and he would parentheses it, put a negative sign out in front of it. Now it's not the negative sign of mathematics where it completely uh, negates the thing, but it diminishes what's being said, makes it less than. Right? So if somebody says, I love you, but, your shit's out, forget it, you know? But it's not gone. You know? What we want to do is change this, but to and. And the reason we want to do that is for, to start what's called the dialectic. Right? This, kid, I, I got really excited uh, a few years ago when I heard some uh, young kids saying, this, that, and the third. And I thought, oh, that man, they got it. They understand the dialectic. This and that. And it is the tension between the two of these things that give rise to the third. Right? Well, that's not what they meant. I don't know what they meant, but it wasn't that. I just misinterpreted what was being said. In order for us, though, to have new thoughts, ideas in the structure of language, we need to conjoin things that sometimes don't go together because we can have different thoughts and feelings about the same thing. It's okay. <clears throat> what we need to do is, in order for them to change or resolve, we have to maintain the tension, right? Good example, Trump. Because everybody has a different feel. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And you have that's to... That's right. But it worked out. <laughs> Love my copy there. One of the things that I hope you will do is to give yourself permission to think and feel and experience that there's discord sometimes in that stuff. And it doesn't mean that you failed. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. It means that this is part of the growing process, right? It's like when you do exercise and you, you tear muscles to build up things, right? This is what our thoughts do, our feelings do. They're, they're gonna stretch and pull. And it's part of what's growing. So it makes us more mature, it makes us more responsible. You know, we, don't have to, we don't have to fit into neat little packages. So anyway, there's um, cards if you need them uh, for me, if you want to know about it. There's some, um, these are books that the library put out that said that they were uh, all about gratitude and there's some, uh, you know, on, on kindness, loving kindness. There's, there's all kinds of great people. Google gratitude on YouTube and you'll see all kinds of things. If you get a chance to see um, uh, David Sandra Rost, take the opportunity, it's really cool. And Oprah did some, she did the soul yeah, things. Soul Sundays, yeah. Super Soul Sundays. Yeah, she had him on. Mm -hmm. She's uh, had Brene Brown too. Yeah. Those are really good. The, Better than going to church. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can any money. Well, you know, every day is church. I mean, yeah. yeah. think of it that way. It's, it's your you. relationship. Thank so. you. Thanks, guys.